Good morning and welcome once again to Digital Look TV. Joining us today is Zach Mir from Master Investor. Zach, thank you very much for your time. Good morning. Zach, okay, the last the meetings of the last Fed meeting uh, came out overnight, the famous Fed minutes, and it took markets by surprise. Uh, traders were expecting, if not dovish, not quite dovish, but rather perhaps a more neutral tone, perhaps slightly hawkish. Instead of that, we seem to have gotten a quite dovish set of minutes. Specifically, they flagged economic weakness in the Eurozone as one of their worries, strength of the dollar, also a specific worry. The Fed seems to be in a constant conundrum. They're constantly going back and forth, switching between we're about to start raising rates, we're not going to start raising rates quite yet. Constant conundrum, is there a way out? Uh, I think I've said before on Digital Look TV, uh, I don't see a way out. I, the, the problem with the zero rate or you know zero interest rates uh, policy is that it's uh, great in terms of stabilizing a, uh, you know, a shock in the markets, uh, soothing investors uh, or traders, but uh, it's not, it's, you know, the, the change from zero rate to normal is a very, very difficult thing to do. I would actually argue that it's almost impossible to do it without uh, causing either a soaring currency or a uh, plunging stock market. And we are, we've seen a little bit of those aspects with the taper tantrum that we had last year. And also in the last uh, couple of months, we've seen the dollar soar to two-year highs in the expectation that the Fed would be raising rates. Uh, and uh, from yes, from, from the latest uh, you know, minutes, there's absolutely no chance of any uh, interest, being ra interest rates being raised at all over the next, let's say, six to nine months even. It could be that long. Uh, and you can also see them clutching for excuses not to do that. Uh, the, the rise in the dollar is obviously something you'd expect with rates, rate, rates going up, and they're citing that as an excuse not to raise rates, which doesn't make any, it's a sort of a, uh, something of a, a paradox. Mm. And also uh, the Eurozone weakness is nothing to do with really the Fed's remit. The Fed should be looking at the U.S. economy rather than worrying about you know, the Eurozone or South Korea or anywhere else, which might be uh, having a bit of difficulty. So it, it's, uh, you know, there's nothing on the horizon there, but it does show, I think, from a trading perspective, that uh, the rise in the dollar in recent weeks has been totally, um, let's say, misguided. Erroneous. Okay. From a historical perspective, would you agree with if I said that what these minutes show, this constant back and forth in the debate within the FOMC, is that really, despite all the talk of a recovery, a steady recovery, a robust growth, or that we're heading in that direction, in reality, in reality the recovery is still rather delicate. Not fragile, perhaps, or perhaps fragile. No. Uh, another thing, which is uh, the, the, the issue with the, the ultra-low interest rate environment and also the, the environment we've had in the last five years since the crisis is that uh, we've had inflate, you know, low inflation or sort of deflation or sort of 1%, you 2% know, inflation. And uh, the lesson there is, is a very, I think, a very simple one, that you have in this environment, um, the QE environment, let's just say, you have uh, low, very low inflation and you have very low growth. And you'll never get, you know, you can't have, unless there's high inflation, you don't actually have any chance of high growth. So we've got to get used to this. That's, you know, we're just basically flatlining. It's a stable, boring type of, you know, thing. It's, there's no boom bust anymore. We're just in a sort of a, a zombie-like state. And, you know, to get more than 2 or 3% growth is, you know, you're not going to get that if you've got inflation at 1% or 2%. Okay. So. Just a moment ago, you touched on a very interesting subject, the strength of the dollar. It's seen a brutal correction downwards, and you believe that that's misguided, it's incorrect. So the dollar, was, the dollar strength has been uh, incorrect. Yeah. So the euro dollar, the brutal yeah. correction lower. Goldman Sachs is talking about euro dollar falling towards parity by 2017. Do you agree with that view? Apparently not. Uh, I think that uh, it's one of the euro dollar is one of those situations that I think everyone uh, or most people in the markets have got that wrong. Um, half, the, half the people are trading it probably didn't actually thought it, it would actually survive beyond 2012. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're nearly like two, three years uh, down the line on that uh, to, to actually, you know, I don't want to be the person who calls, you know, parity on the, on the euro or the breakup of the euro when so many people who are uh, rather cleverer than me or experienced in these matters have got it totally wrong. So, um, you know, the smart money, the, the gurus have been saying that the, the Eurozone's finished and the Euros, obviously the Euro's finished. It hasn't happened yet. It, maybe it will happen next year or the year after, but I don't want to be the person to, to call that. The, the money's been made by being 
uh, even now, uh, taking the, giving the euro the benefit of the doubt or being long of the euro. Um, with, the, with this latest Fed intervention, uh, the euro has bounced back from $1.26. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes back towards one thirty, especially as uh, Draghi's hands are now tied by Ger the German economy or the Germans saying, don't do anything. You can't, you know, we don't want this uh, QE that you're trying to do. Right. Okay. Let's uh, drill deeper, drill down into the equity space. Stocks, a uh, company that's talked about a lot nowadays is Tesco. It's gone through, it's been falling now for quite a bit, for quite a long time. But over the last couple of weeks, really, it's just about crashed. Warren Buffett, a famous investor, quite good, historically at least. Um, I would like to think that he didn't just get lucky uh, by betting on equities on a bull equity market lasting for a couple of decades like Gross did in fixed income. But the fact is, he went into Tesco and he got it horrendously wrong. Now he says that he regrets that decision. Is he getting that horrendously wrong again? I think, I think there's a chance of that. I think he's actually, his, uh, I think the, the new normal phrase associated with the uh, the great man is uh, to be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. In this situation, he's actually demonstrated fear when everybody else has, has also been fearful. Um, I think it's a bit of an emotional reaction here. And there is a chance, actually, ironically, that on this one, he got it wrong by buying it at the top. And he actually might be, uh, let's say, uh, complaining uh, at the bottom of, of, the, of the situation. Now, there's, there's, I mean, there's a reasonable chance that this is a, a near term, you know, 170 uh, pence is a near term floor for the shares. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much upside there's going to be, maybe 10% or 20% at the most, because, you know, it, it's overshot. Um, but uh, it's a situation where, you know, private investors are you know, fascinated by this. Uh, and I think the, the best advice in these situations is normally let the dust settle, let Tesco come out of the headlines and see how the, share, the price action performs and how the company performs for maybe two or three months and then uh, take a view. But uh, this is, uh, you know, this, could be a, this has been a minefield. It's the shares have more than halved since the first profit warning in January 2012. Indeed. And uh, I'm sure the people who are long of it at four pounds, three pounds, and two pounds, who are way offside, and they thought they were going to be, they were buying into something safe. Mm. And it's not been safe. So there is a lesson there in terms of, uh, you know, risk uh, in the market. Risk, risk management, yeah. definitely. Okay, um, perhaps if you can give the viewers a feel for a stock or a group of stocks, a sector, which perhaps you have a more constructive view on? Um, I think, well, I think the, the, the view on Tesco may be constructive in terms of saving people money. Um, but the, uh, in terms of sectors, I think it's a little bit difficult in the sense that uh, um, the FTSE is, you know, sort of towards the bottom end of the range. But uh, we are fearful that it might actually sort of, you know, uh, head lower. Um, the flavor of the month, as far as I'm concerned, is probably the drug stocks, the drug as giants, uh, not only because of... Uh, the Ebola uh, scare, but also just because uh, they have, they have uh, Astra and Shire have been in sort of in the news in terms of uh, uh, the tax inversion play. I think that uh, that could still be revived, and that might be a driver going forward. And also, uh, Glaxo, the other the other big farmer here, uh, has a yield around five percent uh, at the fourteen pound level. So I think it's been hit by the China uh, it's China issues, mm -hmm. um, but. I think most investors probably realize that China is just trying to uh, uh, keep competition uh, out of its markets and, and the fines, are the, the criminal part of those, uh, those accusations are just, uh, it's, it's an, it's an sort of antitrust type of situation. So uh, uh, I think Glaxo, I, you know, should not be sort of tainted uh, uh, too, too much. Oh, fascinating. Okay. And then lastly, but still within the equity space, the FTSE 100, where do you see it by year end? Um, I think that um, the normal sort of, uh, you know, uh, the seasonality is quite an important part of, uh, of the stock market, you know, the sell in May and uh, January effect and other things like that. Um, the normal situation here is that, uh, you know, September is never, September is not a good month. October, obviously, that's sort of crash month. So nobody really feels like buying in October. You tend to get a rebound or, you know, the floor for the market on that sort of autumn dip uh, tends to be the sort of third week uh, or the last week of November uh, has that sort of worked in recent years. And just so, in a way, whatever the, the FTSE is uh, it, it, around you know, November the 20th or 25th, uh, I would take a view at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, so whether it's 6,000 or 6,800, that would be the time to maybe to, to explore going in for a year-end run which I think that even if uh, things are horrible on many fronts, you tend to get at least a, a token window dressing effect on the upside from that time. 
Okay, fantastic. Or magic, as you say here. <laughs> Zach Mira from Esther Investor, thank you very much again. Thank you. And that's all for today from all of us here at Digital Look TV. Until next time, and thank you very much for your time.